Have you ever felt lost with some of Clojure's naming conventions? Well, don't worry. This video is going to give you closure. Uncle Gear. Cool. So the first thing I want to do is create a project using Lime again, and I'm going to call it Closure Style. And then I'm going to open this project in VS Code. Once the project's open, I'm going to go to source core.clj and start my REPL using Culver and select Lime again. The intention of this video is just to cover um, what programmers might find odd when they come from another programming language to Clojure, what naming conventions seem a bit strange, and just to cover why they're there. I think we could start off with this project. So the reason why I started this with Line again is because Line again starts with a main function that looks a bit strange because it has a hyphen before main. And the only reason that is there is to ensure that this main function is unique because it's quite a strange name and it's unlikely it will conflict with any other function names in your code base. So let's get rid of that. So the first thing I want to cover is function and variable metadata. So let's define a variable called my name and we'll just assign it to on the code again. Yeah. So if we evaluate this, we now have my name and it evaluates to on the code again. That's cool. But now we can add metadata to this definition. So if we go with a caret symbol and we pass through a map here and now we can add any data we'd like. So that's a keyword, any and data. If we evaluate this and we check the metadata of our variable my name, we can see that we've added the key any and the value data as metadata. We could also get rid of the map and the value. And if we evaluate this now, then this keyword is automatically going to be set to true in our metadata. So if we evaluate this, any now evaluates to true. There is a use for this metadata. One such use is the keyword dynamic. So if we evaluate this and we check the metadata for my name, we see we've now set dynamic to true. Conventionally, what you'll see is dynamic bindings have earmuffs on them. So that's just two asterisks on either side of the variable name. And if we evaluate this and then this. What we have now is a dynamic binding. There's quite a cool use for this. So let's say we had a function here called print name. And all it did was print the variable my name. So we can go print line my name. We evaluate this and execute it. So I'm just going to execute it here. Print name. We print the name on the code again. But what we could do now is use the binding macro. And then we could change the value of my name to, let's say, I don't know, Dirk. And now if we execute print name and evaluate this, it prints the name Dirk. So we could have a bunch of functions that rely on some binding. And depending on what that binding is, they could change how they work. So that's what that is. And that is pretty cool. There is other metadata that we could use. We could also, if we remove this, we could say string here and evaluate this. And now if we get this metadata back, well, this it's not dynamic anymore. So let's get rid of the earmuffs. And if we evaluate this, we can see that now we've tagged this binding with Java language string. And that just tells Clojure what kind of variable type this is. And that's sometimes needed, especially with Java interop. Cool. So first convention down, let's get rid of this and do another one. So the second thing I want to look at is the question mark. So it's pretty clear in Clojure that you can use question marks. So if we say zero and evaluate this, it evaluates to true. The question mark indicates that the function is going to return a Boolean value. And it's just a cool convention to add to functions and it makes the code nice and readable. So we can empty and this will return true. And if we put a value in here, it'll return false. And there's also identical. If we pass through two ones, it will evaluate to true. One and two, it will evaluate to false. So that's a pretty cool convention. It's quite simple, makes closure really nice to read. We kind of looked at this already, but I want to show you keywords. So keywords look like this. It's basically a colon with a word next to it. And keywords, you normally find them in maps, and they'll work like this. But they're also functions. So if we execute this on this map, this function, this will grab the value of this in the map. And if this doesn't exist, let's call this that, 
it'll return nil. And that's really handy. You may have also seen keywords that look like this. So if we evaluate this, we could see what this does is it namespaces the keyword. So let's just evaluate this. And that's just a keyword, this, that can be used outside of this namespace or in this namespace, and it just is this. But by putting two colons in front, we have namespace this to this. So if we had this in another namespace, so let's actually do that. So I'm going to create another closure file here. Let's call it other.clj. If we defined the this keyword, we can see that it belongs to this namespace. And this one belongs to this namespace. Those are keywords. There's more to them, but I just wanted to show syntactically why they look how they look. So the next thing I want to cover are anonymous functions. They look like this. You put a pound sign and then brackets, and now you actually have a function. And the function takes the arguments as percentage signs. So this would be the first argument. If there's multiple arguments, then it would look like this, one and two. And let's put a multiplication sign in here. So now we've created a function that multiplies two arguments. If we evaluate this, we can't really use it, it's anonymous. So let's make it non-anonymous by defining it to a symbol. So I'm gonna say times fn. And now if we evaluate this, we can go times fn one and two, and it'll work. If for instance, we just had three and two, now this function expects to take three arguments and it will just ignore the first one. So we could have one, two, three, and we'd get six because it's just using the third and the second argument. That brings me to my third naming convention, and that is the underscore. So I'm gonna get rid of this. So sometimes you may have seen an underscore used in a function. Let's actually create a let binding, and let's say we had the variable a, and it's 10, and the variable b, it'll be 20. And what you could do here is you could use an underscore, and we could, on our print line, um, a and b, and if we evaluate this, what we've done here is we've said we don't actually care about the value. We just want this to execute. So that's one way you can use the underscore. It will still actually have a value. You can actually, like if we return underscore, uh, because print line returns null, but let's say underscore, let's make these multiply by each other. It still actually is assigned a value, but the underscore is a convention to say we don't care what it means. And you'll see this a lot with the structuring. So I'm gonna create a vector here and call it my vec and let's put the values a b and c here now let's create a function that destructures the list so we can define let's say we'll print vec to destructure a vector we can just pass through another vector and let's say we want to ignore well let's say we want to use the first value we'll call it a we want to ignore the second value that's b and we want to use the third value that's c so now we can return a string of A and C. And if we evaluate this, we can now print vec and we'll pass through my vec and we'll get AC. We're effectively saying to this function, we don't care about that middle value, but the value is actually still there. You could, if you wanted to call it underscore and it'll still work. So in the beginning of this video, we saw that the main function actually took in um, quite a weird argument list. So let's define the function. I'm going to call it my fn, and it's going to take in ampersand args. So it had this ampersand in front. And what that ampersand does is it basically says that this function takes in a variable amount of arguments. So let's just return a string of those of the arguments. If we evaluate this and run my fn with no arguments, we'll get a blank string. If we run it with one argument, we can see that args is actually a list of arguments. So it just puts all our arguments into a list. So if we had one, two, three, we'd get a list back of one, two, three. And we can actually put arguments in front of here. So we could say a and args. So we can print out a and then args. And now one will be defined as a in this function and two and three will be returned in a list. And we see that here. Occasionally, you might see functions that start with a period. So let's use to uppercase as a function. And these functions are actually Java functions. So in Java, if you have a string, let's say, hey, a string will have a function dot to uppercase defined. 
and you can run to uppercase on your string. Another thing you'll sometimes see is a single quote. So let's I'm going to define a variable called, let's be original again, we'll call it my var, we'll assign it to the string var. So if we evaluate this, we could evaluate my var, and we'll see, and we'll see the value is var, but if we evaluate it with the quote in front, so now we're just getting back the symbol of my var. If we use a pound sign plus a quote and then my var and evaluate this, what we're getting back now is the actual variable. And we could get the value from this variable by wrapping it in a function called dot get. And now we'll get our value back. So that's because a variable is basically a binding between a symbol and a value. In this case, the symbol is my var and the value is var. And this is the variable. I hope that makes sense. You may have also noticed a convention where some functions in Clojure end with an exclamation mark. So say I had an atom, I'm going to define it as my atom, and it's just going to be an atom with a null value. To get the value of an atom, you'll use the at symbol. So if we just get my atom and evaluate it, you'll see that it's defined just as an atom. So to get the value out of an atom, we'll need to use the at sign. And now we'll get the value out. Let's give it a bit of more of an interesting value. I'm going to give it a value of 10. Let's deref this. Now we see we get the value out because we have this at sign. And this at sign is actually just syntactic sugar for the function deref. And that also just gets the value out of the atom. So some functions that we use with atoms have this naming convention where they end with an exclamation mark. Let's actually use the reset function. Functions in Clojure that end with an exclamation mark basically indicate that the function has side effects or that the function isn't thread safe. Let's reset my atom with the value of two. And if we evaluate this, then that works. And now the value of my, of my atom has actually changed. Now it's two. And that was the side effect of this function. So there's a macro in Clojure which looks pretty strange. It looks like this. And there's another one that looks like this. These are just macros that push a value to either the first argument of a function or the last argument of a function. So let's say we had the value of hey. Now if we had a function string there and we evaluate this, we'll get hey there because hey is being pushed as the first argument to string. And if we did the same with the thread last macro and evaluated this, we'd get there hey because now hey is being passed to the last argument of string. The last thing I wanna cover is the regex syntax enclosure. So that looks like this. We'll have a pound sign and quotes. Now we can go, I'm gonna refine and that takes in some regex and let's pass through a string here on the code again and if we searched for the we'll get the back if we didn't have the in the string we get null back but because it's regex we can make it more interesting so we can use reseek and this takes in regex and let's have a string which has numbers and words and numbers and more words and evaluate this, cool. We just get back empty strings back, but if we said digits plus, we'll just get back all the digit characters. So I think I've covered most of the, like the odd syntax here. If there's anything else that you're unsure of, you can leave a comment down below and I will try and get to it as soon as possible. If not, I'm sure somebody else will help you. Everyone's very helpful. So cheers guys, catch you in the next one, bye.